In this continuing process, Britain's early achievement of industrialism gave it such great profits that these, combined with the profits derived earlier from commercial capitalism and the simultaneous profits derived from the unearned rise in land values from new cities and mines, made its early industrial enterprises largely self-financed, or at least locally financed. They were organized in proprietorships and partnerships, had contact with local deposit banks for short-term current loans, but had little to do with international bankers, investment banks, central governments, or corporative forms of business organization. This early stage of industrial capitalism, which lasted in England from about 1770 to about 1850, was shared to some extent with Belgium and even France, but took quite different forms in the United States, Germany, and Italy, and almost totally different forms in Russia or Asia. The chief reason for these differences was the need for raising funds, capital, to pay for the rearrangements of the factors of production, land, labor, materials, skill, equipment, and so on, which industrialism required. Northwestern Europe, and above all, England, had large savings for such new enterprises. Central Europe and North America had much less while Eastern and Southern Europe had very little in private hands. The more difficulty an area had in mobilizing capital for industrialization, the more significant was the role of investment bankers and of governments in the industrial process. In fact, the early forms of industrialism based on textiles, iron, coal, and steam spread so slowly from England to Europe that England was itself entering upon the next stage of financial capitalism by the time Germany and the United States, about 1850, were just beginning to industrialize. This new stage of financial capitalism, which continued to dominate England, France, and the United States as late as 1930, was made necessary by the great mobilizations of capital needed for railroad building after 1830. The capital needed for railroads with their enormous expenditures on track and equipment, could not be raised from single proprietorships, or partnerships, or locally, but, instead, required a new form of enterprise, the limited liability stock corporation, and a new source of funds, the international investment banker, who had, until then, concentrated his attention almost entirely on international flotations of government bonds. The demands of railroads for equipment carried this same development, almost at once, into steel manufacturing and coal mining. As we have said, the stage of financial capitalism did not place emphasis on the exchange of goods or the production of goods as the earlier stages of commercial capitalism and industrial capitalism had done. In fact, financial capitalism had little interest in goods at all but was concerned entirely with claims on wealth, stocks, bonds, mortgages, insurance, deposits, proxies, interest rates, and such. It invested capital not because it desired to increase the output of goods or services, but because it desired to float issues, frequently excess issues, of securities on this productive basis. It built railroads in order to sell securities, not in order to transport goods. It constructed great steel corporations to sell securities, not in order to make steel, and so on. But, incidentally, it greatly increased the transport of goods, the output of steel, the production of other goods. By the middle of the stage of financial capitalism, however, the organization of financial capitalism had evolved to a highly sophisticated level of security promotion and speculation, which did not require any productive investment as a basis. Corporations were built upon corporations in the form of holding companies, so that securities were issued in huge quantities, bringing profitable fees and commissions to financial capitalists without any increase in economic production whatever. Indeed, these financial capitalists discovered that they could not only make killings out of the issuing of such securities, 
they could also make killings out of the bankruptcy of such corporations through the fees and commissions of reorganization. A very pleasant cycle of flotation, bankruptcy, flotation, bankruptcy began to be practiced by the financial capitalists. The more excessive the flotation, the greater the profits, and the more imminent the bankruptcy. The more frequent the bankruptcy, the greater the profits of reorganization, and the sooner the opportunity of another excessive flotation, with its accompanying profits. This excessive stage reached its highest peak only in the United States. In Europe, it was achieved only in isolated cases. The growth of financial capitalism made possible a centralization of world economic control and a use of this power for the direct benefit of financiers and the indirect injury of all other economic groups.